So if, if um, you know, if, if I'm out trying to get um, an, uh, an A in a course, um, so a, you know, a grade of 80 to 90, let's say, in, in some particular course, and that's the outcome that I'm trying to reach. But I know me and my study habits and my intelligence and my attendance and, and all of these things. And I may know that my outcome expectation for that highly valued, you know, 80 to 90 mark, that my outcome expectation for that um, is, is fairly, you know, relatively low. Let's say, you know, about a 60% chance of getting that kind of a grade. But now, you know, I've gone through another, a few other exams. I'm starting to get grades back in other courses. And, and these other courses, hey, I'm starting to, you know, rack up some better grades. I'm improving my study habits. I'm making sure I attend class. I, I you know, I've improved the way I take notes. Um, I've joined a study group, and I'm getting help from them. Um, so I'm improving my behaviors. I'm getting successes. My confidence is starting to come up. And now I, start, I may start amending my outcome expectation that indeed, you know, 80 to 90, a grade of 80 to 90 percent, um, I may start thinking I've got an 80 percent chance that, that I can do that now. And of course, as I increase in that confidence and start increasing my outcome expectations, who knows? I may want to change the incentive value of the outcome. I might want to start amending this to 90 to 95 as this ripples through the motivational model because of increased confidence. Of course, the reverse is also true. If I'm going into exam after exam and getting knocked down and, and my confidence begins to ebb and, and, and drop that I can actually write university exams and handle university material and this starts going down to about 20% confidence. And, and then again, we may see that negative ripple through the model. Okay, so that's Bandura's theory of self-efficacy. Questions? No? Everybody's got it? Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> Magnificent stuff. Uh, the uh, next kind of a, an approach that we get in motivation um, is the cognitive approach. And uh, the cognitive approach, as the name implies, is going to be uh, actually, Van Dura's theory is very much a cognitive theory, too. I mean, the way we think about ourselves and our abilities. <coughs> but in the cognitive approach, we'll see this again in clinical um, psychology at the end of the, the term. The clinical approach was this kind of reaction to behaviorism, and particularly to the mechanistic kinds of theories of motivation. And a number of theorists were saying that, you know, we, we are more than just robotic responders to you know, stimuli in our environment and to, you know, the dangling carrot. That, in fact, people, particularly in exercising choice, actually think about the kinds of environments they want to engage in, what sorts of outcomes they want to pursue, what value they attach to them, etc. So that people are very much mentally engaged in their own motivation. And perhaps the most famous of the cognitive theories of human motivation is one that's called the cognitive evaluation theory by a chap by the name of Edward Deasy. Now, it's a rather, uh, I think, ill-chosen sort of title because it it's a little complex, but, but I trust at the, the end you'll be able to see why he called it the cognitive evaluation theory. <clears throat> DC kind of does something like Bandura does. Re recall, like, me, Bandura comes along <coughs> and says, hey, nice theory you've got going there, everybody. 
um, pretty complete now. We're starting to understand more and more about human motivation. Um, we're able to predict arousal, persistence, and choices better than we could before. We're able to control human motivation more. If I'm a teacher, a parent, a coach, um, even for myself, I can understand and control motivation more than we could before. Great work, everybody. But Bandura had come along and said, nice set of expectations, but there's another set earlier in the model. DC kind of comes along and says, nice incentive values, folks, but there's another set of incentive values that you don't have in the model. And DC differentiated between extrinsic <coughs> incentives or extrinsic value of outcomes and the intrinsic value of behavior. In essence, the model that we had on the board before was exclusively appropriate to outcome-oriented actions. Behaviors that were engaged in to produce some desirable outcome or avoid an undesirable outcome. But yet, we often engage in behaviors because we enjoy the behaviors. They may or may not produce desirable outcomes, but we enjoy the behavior. They may in fact even produce undesirable outcomes, such as in gambling. But if I engage in an activity because this has value to me, that might be sufficient motivation for this person to do that behavior. And, and we could, in essence, you know, end the, the, the model right here. And that would be a full model of motivation, of why people do what they do. Now, the classic case of that is activity that we call play. <coughs> Indeed, by definition, if one plays, if one is engaged in play, that means that it is intrinsically rewarding, inherently pleasurable. The doing is what's fun. Well, I mean, that's it. I mean, we call it fun. Boy, this is, this is wonderful. I like this. I enjoy this. Now, it still may, and often will in some form or another, produce outcomes. But the outcomes will have less incentive value or less of a motivational impact on why we are doing the behavior in the strict sense of play. You watch children at play. They can go on for hours and hours and hours engaged in various activities. Absolutely um, ignorant of and oblivious to any potential outcomes. It is being produced by the pleasure of the activity. But children inevitably, as a result of their play, do have various kinds of benefits and even some costs that result from that. I mean, they do start to learn how to engage in certain activity. They start getting muscular coordination, etc., etc., etc. But those aren't, aren't, aren't driving the model at all. It's not part of the fuel for the motivation. It ends here. Now, one of the, the neat things about DC kind of plugging this into the model is once again, we begin to be able to have a, a more complete understanding of a number of human scenarios with regards to motivation. Typically, if I 
enjoy the behavior of something. That is going to be sufficient justification or sufficient motivation for me to actually engage in that kind of a behavior. Um, let's, let's work with some examples. Let's say that, uh, well, the piano playing I was talking about last class. 